had the highway of tears. And so there's just lack of infrastructure. There's no buses to go from one community to the other community. So women often will hitchhike. And we were losing women to um, the trucks, the truck drivings that were going by. Um, and so people were like, and it's such a remote area, and it's so wooded that you could so easily murder and hide bodies up in the north that of course so many of these bodies were never even found. But it actually, when it was <laughs> two white women that went missing, that it really hit the fan. And people started being like, what is going on in the northern part of BC? What is going on with this highway of tears? And then you found so many more indigenous women that had been missing from that highway. And so once again, um, what happens to non-indigenous people that we put a pretty big, we don't even need to, well, the news will be there by themselves. But when it's indigenous women, it's often not even reported, not even shows up on the news. It's kind of like, oh, well, one more, you know, and that's how the police treated so many of the women that went forward about Robert Pifton and had basically sounded the alarm for years about him. And the police in Vancouver did nothing. And they also had to apologize to indigenous families. So, so this is obviously why we're here today. It was because of this systemic neglect and denial that we indigenous women had to take up to their streets themselves to bring awareness to the amount of indigenous women that were going missing and that were being murdered and nobody was doing zero about it. Um, so, as you know, there was the Truth and Reconciliation Report that came out. There's also um, the Reclaiming the Power in Place, um, the Executive Summary of the MMIWG Inquiry, um, where they claimed there are four pathways that maintain colonial violence. So out of this report, they spoke of the historical and multi-generational and intergenerational trauma, because when you're raised in a colonial um, history of family, you are raised in violence, truly. And the social economic marginalization, so that's that systemic establishing of a permanent second underclass citizen. There's this idea that we will always have these people outside of any kind of system that would benefit them. So like if we create capitalism, capitalism isn't for indigenous people, it's not for their benefit. So we keep them out of the systems that would benefit. So we ensure their poverty, we ensure that they are underfunded, we ensure that they don't have resources, we are sure that their, their wealth, the wealth of the land is not shared with them. That's why they keep them in poverty in terms of corporations and indigenous peoples of these lands. And then ignoring the agency and expertise of indigenous women. And this is that concept of nothing for us without us, right? Indigenous women were denied, their families were denied access to those original places when they were starting this report. And so there was an erasure of the family's needs and they knew people are experts in their own lives. And so removing them from that level of expertise for the report really honestly slowed down the report and really made the report cumbersome for it to be pushed through. It had lots of struggles in the beginning, but it's still, the need for it is still there. And we see it because, once again, in 2023, we had another three indigenous women go missing um, in Winnipeg. And their families knew that there were parts, clothing of theirs that were found in the landfill. And the government, the premier, right now it's Wab Kanu is the premier of Manitoba, but at the time, um, the premier Stephenson announced that her government was not gonna look in those landfills for those three indigenous women. So this is the daughter of one of the women who's literally basically set up a camp outside of that uh, landfill and has basically held a permanent protest until they, they, the government agrees to go and find her, their mother. And so this is another example of literally, even today, the government refusing to just do the minimum to find indigenous women. And unfortunately, we see it to this violence, this particularly sexualized violence, patriarchal violence, it kind of breaks my heart because they targeted indigenous men to collude with the patriarchy, to basically, here's some cookies. If you 
participate in the patriarchy, not the way your indigenous nations would, but the way we participate, in the way we benefit from patriarchy. And so it's like, now you can um, hit your women. And actually, I would say Jesuit did teach how to hit your wife and your children as part of being good Christians. And so the collusion that's been going on has been going on for a long time. And so often there's land defense movements that are happening right now up in Wet'suwet'en, um, the old growth protests, um, other land defense across Ontario. But what's happening in those movements is that sexual violence is actually destroying those movements from the inside out, right? So sexual violence is still happening at these camps. Labor is being distributed in like, oh, that who carries the chainsaw has the power and is seen as more powerful in the camp. And that person affords the knowledge because doesn't want to contribute to the rest. And so you'll see a lot of like hierarchical colonial behavior happening at these land defend camps. And so that's when we say, when we're saying for indigenous nations to decolonize, not just to decolonize language, not just to decolonize culture, but to also unlearn patriarchal violence and harm that has been absolutely absorbed into the culture. And so I'm going to finish with a little video. Um, indigenous women in, in South America, which is one of the biggest protests that actually emerged recently out of um, uh, women were protesting um, poor living conditions, poor wages, um, lack of education, um, more of the social um, struggles. And so in those arrests, the police were starting to rape um, the people that they would arrest, particularly the women. They started to rape them. Um, and so the women decided to get together. Uh, there's a collective particularly called La Thesis. They were actually writing their thesis, which is La Thesis, <laughs> the thesis uh, yeah, of a Chilean um, collective of women. And they wrote um, a, um, a protest towards basically naming that the state, that it's the judges, that it's the police, that it's the system that denies their violence, that doesn't arrest the people that kill them, that doesn't um, do anything towards the people that commit femicide against them. And it was, in, in Chile we have a, a common practice of protesting where we weren't allowed to speak or disrupt, but we were allowed to point. So we would just point to places that were torture camps or places where people were being tortured or where people were being held prisoners because there was a lot of arrest and imprisonment when we were going through our dictatorships. But now that um, there is a democratic process, they actually went to the police station to point, to point who's actually committing these rapes. It's actually the police. And so it became one of the, the global marches that um, talks about it. So I'm just going to click on a little bit on the link so that you folks can take a look at it. Because while this violence is very pervasive and ongoing, women's resistance is also rising to meet this violence. scarves are for access to abortion, and the black scarves are for indigenous women's um, freedom. Yeah. 